Hello, everybody. Welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. So today we have a Juan Orendain. He's going to talk about double categories. So uh, maybe one, one announcement about questions. So if you want to ask questions, please use the chat or raise your hand on Zoom. And uh, I will unmute you and allow you to ask the questions. OK, uh, so uh, Juan. You will now be muted. Please unmute yourself, okay? Um, okay. So now you're muted. Please, please unmute yourself. Okay. And yeah, please go ahead. Welcome. Um, okay, so, well, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the organizers. Uh, yeah, David, Brendan, and Paolo. So for organizing the seminar and making it available for all of us. And of course, for accepting my talk. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the title of the talk is Globularly Generated Double Categories. Um, the plan is the following. So I'll start with a few preliminary on by categories and double categories. Then I will talk a bit about the by category of the name algebras, and I'll end with a, few, with a brief introduction with a few results on globularly generated double categories. Um, yeah, so by categories. So a bicategory is a category enriched by categories. So the concept was introduced by Benabou in 67. So a bicategory has objects, morphisms, which we call one morphisms, and morphisms between morphisms, which we call two morphisms. Uh, it also has uh, a horizontal composition operation for one morphisms, uh, a vertical composition operation for two morphisms, and a second horizontal composition for two morphisms, each of these composition operations with uh, a corresponding identity. As usual, we assume that vertical composition is strictly associative and unital, and that horizontal composition is only uh, associative and unital of two compatible natural isomorphisms. Uh, vertical and horizontal compositions satisfy the exchange property, as always. So uh, we'll denote by DCAT uh, the category of bicategories and pseudocontors. So uh, bicategories are usually organized into a tricategory, but we'll mostly be interested in the underlying category of this. Uh, we'll use the usual um, globular pictorial representation for bicategory. So if B is a bicategory, we'll represent objects, one morphisms, and horizontal uh, one dimensional composition, like so. So objects will be vertices, um, horizontal morphisms will be uh, arrows, and we'll uh, uh, implement horizontal composition by concatenation. Uh, we'll represent two morphisms, uh, vertical composition is, and horizontal composition. Uh, like so. So two morphisms will be globes like this. We'll read uh, two morphisms from bottom to top. So this will represent a two morphism from this arrow to this arrow. And we'll implement a uh, vertical and horizontal composition by usual concatenation. Uh, in this setting, the exchange relation reads uh, as follows. So if we have any composite diagram like this, then any two possible interpretations of this diagram are the same. So, okay. Now double categories. So a double category is a category uh, internal to categories. Uh, the concept was introduced by Erisman in 63. Uh, so a double category C has uh, a category of objects and a category of morphisms, which we denote by C0 and C1 respectively, a source and target functor, which we denote by C, S, and T respectively, a horizontal identity functor, which we denote by I, and a horizontal composition functor, which we denote by star. Uh, we assume that these satisfy uh, factorial versions of the usual conditions defining a category. So we'd like to think of um, double categories as categories where every set is turned into a category and every structure function into a functor. Uh, the non-strict version of this is usually referred to as a pseudo double category. So we'll just call pseudo double categories of double categories in the talk. Uh, we'll write DCAT for the um, category of double categories and double functors. So again, uh, double categories are usually organized into a two category uh, and will only be interested uh, mostly in the category underlying this two category. Uh, so we'll denote it like this. Um, yeah, double categories also have a very nice pictorial representation. So suppose C is a double category. Uh, objects and morphisms of the category of object C0 of C are usually referred to as the objects and vertical morphisms of C. And the objects and morphisms of the category of morphisms of C, C1 are usually referred to as the horizontal morphisms and the squares of C. 
and they're usually drawn like this. So objects as vertices, uh, vertical morphisms as vertical arrows pointing um, to upwards, and uh, horizontal morphisms as horizontal arrows, and squares as squares like so. So squares are read from bottom to top and from left to right. Uh, vertical and horizontal compositions are implemented by vertical and horizontal concatenation. So uh, this is the vertical composition of these two squares and the horizontal composition of two squares. Um, okay, so the horizontal by category. So suppose C is a double category. So we'll say that a square in C is globular if it's of this form. So uh, a square in a double category is globular if its vertical arrows are identities. So objects, horizontal morphisms, and globular squares of a double category C form a by category, which we denote by HC, and which we call the horizontal by category of C. Uh, the function associating to every double category its horizontal by category extends to a functor which we denote by H from uh, double categories to by categories. Uh, so this horizontalization, uh, horizontal by category functor just uh, takes a double category and flatten it, flattens it to a by category. Uh, so H admits uh, right inverses. So one example of this is the following. So I suppose B is a by category, we write um, uh, bold HB for the double category whose squares are of this form, where phi is a two morphism in B uh, from here to here. So uh, bold H of B just takes every globular diagram of B and puffins it to a square just by taking uh, ver uh, trivial vertical arrows. So bold HB is referred to as the trivial double category associated to the bi category B. And the function uh, associating to every by category, it's a uh, trivial double category extends to an embedding of uh, old age from uh, by categories to double categories. So uh, this horizontalization functor and the trivial double category embedding are related via this um, uh, junction. Um, so this horizontalization uh, functor actually admits another right inverse if we restrict ourselves to uh, strict double categories. Um, if B is a two category, uh, a strict by a strict by category, then uh, we write QB for the double category whose squares are of this form, uh, where this is a two morphism from alpha from this uh, corner to this corner in our two category B. Uh, we denote any such square uh, with a quintet like this. Um, and so we call QB the Erisman double category of quintets. Of so we don't call it this, so it's called the uh, Erisman double category of quintets. Of so uh, that was defined QB. Uh, satisfies this equation here. So the horizontal by category of the quintets of B is equal to B. Uh, the double category uh, QB is what is known as an edge symmetric uh, double category with connection. So the concept was introduced by Brown and also in your paper in 99. And the functor associating to every two category, uh, its double category of quintets extends to an equivalent from uh, two categories to the category of double edge symmetric double categories uh, with connection. Um, so when B is a proper by category, not a two category, then QB is not a double category, but a parity double category. Uh, so uh, this um, uh, Erisman double category of quintets construction defines another right inverse to uh, horizontalization uh, if we restrict ourselves to a uh, strict double category. So the main difference between these two inverses is in the uh, categories of vertical arrows. Um, so yeah, so if, we, if you take a, a two category, then the category of vertical arrows of the uh, trivial do double category associated to this by category is trivial. And uh, if you take the uh, quintet's construction, then it's the category of horizontal arrows of the two category. Um, okay, so another example of this relation between a double category and its horizontal uh, by category is described by this. Uh, by category of modules, of algebras and modules. So write mod for the by category whose two morphisms are of this form, where A and B are uh, unital uh, complex algebras, where M is an AB by module and N is another AB by module, and where phi is a by module morphism from M to N. So uh, mod is the by category whose objects are algebras, morphisms are by modules, and two morphisms are by module morphisms. Um, the horizontal identity in mod is the trivial by module of an algebra, and the horizontal composition is given by a relative to phi. Uh, so observe that if A and B are algebras, then A and B are isomorphic in mod, if and only if A and B are more than equivalent. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, the observation that I want to make here is that uh, so we organize algebras into this uh, by category. Um, so these uh, so two algebras are isomorphic in this categorical object if and only if they're merely equivalent. Uh, there's another notion of isomorphism, which is the usual isomorphism relation between algebras. So this is a weaker relation. Um, okay, so we can extend this to a double category. So if we write bracketed mod for the double category whose squares are of this form. So these are squares where uh, vertices are again complex unital algebras. So A, B, C, and D are algebras. M and N are uh, A, B, and C, D by modules, where F and G are algebra morphisms, and where phi is, well, I wrote psi here, sorry, <laughs> is a linear transformation satisfying this equation here. Um, so uh, bracketed mod is the double category whose squares are equivariant by module morphisms. Uh, the horizontal identity and horizontal composition in bracketed mod are defined by the obvious functorial extensions of the horizontal identity and horizontal composition in mod. Uh, mod and bracketed mod I, are related by this equation here. There should be an H here. So the horizontal, sorry, the horizontal by category of E double category bracketed mod is a uh, mod, of course. Uh, now, why is this example interesting? Um, well, for many reasons, but I chose symmetric monoidal structures of uh, a mod to explain why this would be interesting at all. Um, well, tensor product of algebras, vector spaces, and linear transformations morally provide mod with the structure of asymmetric monoidal by category. Uh, so if this is the case, then we should have a coherence invertible by module satisfying a bunch of very complicated equations. Um, yeah, the uh, precise definition of what a monoidal by category is, uh, and asymmetric monoidal by categories is presented in any of these references. Uh, so it's just a so it's a very beautiful object, but just very complicated for our purposes. Uh, the coherence data for uh, the tensor product of algebras is actually naturally defined in terms of unical morphisms and satisfies the McLean equation strictly. So um, yeah, those definitions here seem a bit accepted for this purposes. So we do need a different language to express this structure. Um, so uh, tensor products of vertices, edges, and squares so in, uh, bracketed mod provide bracketed mod with the structure of asymmetric uh, pseudomonoid in double categories. Well, here we need uh, double categories to be a two category, but this is the only place where we do this. Um, so, um, yeah, bracketed mod is asymmetric monoidal double category. So, rover, uh, bracketed mod is what is known as a vibrant double category or a framed uh, by category, which uh, essentially means that the coherence isomorphism. So, uh, bracketed mod descent to uh, coherence isomorphisms for asymmetric monoidal structure on mod with uh, tensor product uh, provided by the horizontalization of uh, this tensor product structure here, or uh, this uh, symmetric monoidal uh, moral structure here. So this uh, procedure is uh, very, um, so it was um, defined uh, in this preprint here, so it's a very nice uh, paper, so it's highly recommended. Uh, bracketed mod, uh, so we consider bracketed mod as the uh, correct framework uh, to equip algebras with a two-dimensional symmetric monoidal structure. Um, so yeah, this is why this relation here is interesting amongst uh, many other reasons. Um, so we have the following observations. So there are essentially two types of by categories uh, exemplified by cat. Uh, and mod, so where cat is the two category of categories, functors, and natural transformations. So cat has objects, which are categories, uh, functions between objects, uh, functors, uh, as one morphisms, and morphisms between these functions as two morphisms, so natural transformations. So cat has uh, categories, morphisms, of, of function type morphisms as uh, one morphisms, and two morphisms are is morphisms between these uh, morphisms. Now, the other type is exemplified by mod, where the objects are algebras. Uh, the one morphisms are by modules, which are, which are objects themselves, and where uh, two morphisms are morphisms between those uh, one dimensional objects. Um, so, there is a correct notion, more correct notion of morphism between objects and mod between algebras, which is not by modules, it's morphisms of algebras, which is not directly included. Uh, in our bicategory mod. So uh, we have these two types of bicategories, so cat-like bicategories and mod-like bicategories. Uh, so bicategories fitting the above description of mod are 
uh, called mod like by categories in this uh, very nice, uh, very difficult to understand paper. Uh, so this is not exactly the way uh, they're defined. So I'm not sure I can ex uh, I'm able to express uh, the, uh, correctly the way uh, we should describe mod like by categories. But essentially, yeah, by categories, subjects are algebras of some sort. Uh, one morphisms are by modules of some sort, and two morphisms are by module morphisms are uh, mod like by categories. And we should treat uh, by categories defined uh, in this way as we treat modules. Uh, so the slogan here is that uh, a mod like by category B should have uh, a second category of functions or correct or strict morphisms, which we should, which we would write as B star, and we would think as a vertical direction with respect to globular diagrams. So if this is the case, uh, it would be expected, expected that there should be a clear lift of B to a double category C, where the vertical arrows are the strict. Uh, or correct or function uh, notion of morphisms and such that the globular squares of this double category are the original uh, globular diagrams for our mod like by category. Uh, and if we're in this situation and we wanted to define asymmetric material structure on our mod like by category, then uh, the philosophy here is that it should be better to, uh, this uh, symmetric monoidal structure should be better expressed as, as asymmetric monoidal structure on this uh, double category list of our mod like by category. So yeah, so this is the, um, yeah, the slogan that we're going with. So um, yeah, so I wanna talk a bit about the uh, by category of Banaven algebras. Um, yeah, so this is a type of mod like uh, by category that um, yeah, we're interested in. Um, yeah, so, just define uh, the name algebra from scratch. Uh, so I uh, suppose H is a Hilbert space. Uh, we'll write BH for the set of bounded operators in H. That is, BH is the set of all um, linear transformations from H to H satisfying this inequality here. Uh, thus defined BH is obviously a unique star algebra, where the product is the uh, composition of operators and the star operation is the uh, operation that associates to every operator it's a joint. So uh, Benayman algebras admit two uh, definitions, so one topological and one algebraic. So I'll just go for the algebraic definition. So this requires this uh, concept of uh, the content. So suppose uh, X is a set of bounded operators on this Hilbert space, then we'll write X prime for the set of all bounded operators on uh, H such that uh, they commute with every element of X. So that's the finding. Uh, so we call X prime the commutant of X. So um, intuitively, X prime is the set of all symmetries of X in H. Now observe that um, the commutant of the commutant of any uh, set of bounded operators contains uh, the original set of bounded operators. Uh, so we have the following definition. So suppose H is a Hilbert space, then uh, A binomial algebra on H is a star subalgebra A of uh, the bounded operators of H, such that A is equal to its double commutant. So uh, intuitively, Banaven algebras are um, uh, star algebras of operators which are maximal with respect to self symmetries, uh, in a sense. So, uh, Banaven algebras model algebras of observables associated to regions of space time in algebraic quantum field theory, uh, in models in algebraic quantum field theory, for example, in conformal field theory. So, they're very important in uh, algebraic quantum field theory. Um, we have uh, some examples. So suppose H is a Hilbert space and BH is always a Banaven algebra. So in particular, matrix algebras are Banaven algebras. Uh, if X comma mu is a nice measure space, which uh, by nice I mean sigma infinite, <laughs> then L infinity of X is a commutative Banaven algebra represented in L2 of X. Uh, all commutative Banaven algebras are of this form. So um, Essentially, so every commutative uh, Banaven algebra is L infinity of some nice measure space. And in this sense, we consider Banaven algebras as non commutative uh, measure spaces in the same way that we consider C star algebras as non commutative topological spaces. Um, if G is a group uh, in H is a Hilbert space uh, and uh, lambda is a unitary representation of G in H, then the commutant of G uh, in H is also a Banaven algebra. So, in particular, if G is discrete, then G has a left regular representation on L2 of G. In that case, uh, the commutant of this representation in L2 of G is also a Banaven algebra. So we call this the group Banaven algebra of the group G, and we denote it like this. So uh, Banaven algebra 
those are uh, algebras of operators, which are maximal with respect to self-symmetries, in a sense. Um, also, in another sense, are uh, non-commutative measure spaces, and in another sense, they're um, symmetries of unitary representations of groups. So, uh, yeah, very interesting objects. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're actually interested uh, in a specific type of Banach algebra. So we're interested in factors. So suppose A is a Banach algebra on a Hilbert space H, uh, then this uh, is called the center of A. So if A is, so we say that A is a factor if its center is trivial. So factors are trivial Banach algebras. So sorry, factors are the simple Banach algebras and are also the most non-commutative uh, of all Banach algebras. Uh, every Banach algebra can be built uh, in an essentially unique way from factors through what is known as the direct integral uh, operation. So the slogan here is that we, if we're trying to understand uh, Banach algebras, we better understand factors. We just focus on factors. Um, so we have the following examples of factors. So uh, if H is any Hilbert space, then BH is a factor. Uh, matrix algebras are factors. Uh, this tower of uh, matrix algebras, uh, its closure in some sense, uh, is a factor. We call this the uh, hyperfinite factor. Uh, if G is uh, an ICC group, uh, that means that uh, every non-trivial conjugacy class of G is infinite, then uh, the group of an algebra of G is a factor. Um, OK, well, a subfactor is an inclusion of factors. So it's just uh, two factors, uh, A and B, where one is containing the other. An example of this is uh, an inclusion of ICC groups. Uh, the corresponding factors, group factors, uh, form a form a subfactor. Uh, so the Jones index of a subfactor like this, introduced by Jones in '83, is a generalized quantized dimension taking values in this set, measuring how um, this algebra uh, is contained in this algebra here. So subfactors express how observables interact when one region is contained in the other in this formulations in algebraic quantum field theory. So uh, if we have one region of space-time containing the other and we have observables, then uh, yeah, we get, if, if our theory is uh, simple enough, then we get a stop factor and the index sort of measures how uh, uh, these observables are contained in the other uh, observables. <laughs> um, okay, so we have uh, Benham algebras. Uh, we're interested in factors. Uh, then we have um, morphisms and bimodules of uh, Banach algebras and factors. Uh, so suppose A and B are Banach algebras. Suppose F is a unital star morphism. Then we say that F is a normal morphism if F is continuous. Well, here I put it put continuous in quotation. So I mentioned that there's two definitions of Banach algebras: one algebraic, one uh, analytic. This analytic definition is in terms of some topology. So. Algebra, uh, the name algebras are um, topological algebras. So uh, normal morphisms are star morphisms that are continuous with their topology. So this is not important. So you should think of uh, normal morphisms as a Banach version of usual morphisms with algebra. So write BN for the category of Banach algebras and normal morphisms, and write FACT for the full top category of factors. Um, so suppose AB are Banach algebras, and an AB Hilbert by module is just a a Hilbert space together with a left and right action by A and B, respectively, such that the two actions commute. So given two by modules H and K, uh, an inter intertwiner from H to K, just a bounded operator from H to K are uh, intertwining the A and B actions. Uh, so we suggestively uh, represent uh, intertwiners like so, so like lobular diagrams. So this represents uh, an intertwiner from an A, B uh, Hilbert by module to another A, B Hilbert by module H to K. So of course we want to organize by name algebras into a by category. So we wish to organize the above pictures into a by category, which we want to write as W star. So uh, by name algebras are also called W star algebras, so we call this W star. So we have uh, the above pictures. So we have objects one morphisms, two morphisms, and the usual composition of intertwiners is vertical to uh, dimensional composition. Uh, so now what do we need? We need a horizontal identity and a horizontal composition. So we have uh, Banach algebras by modules by module intertwiners. We have an obvious compositions for uh, two morphisms. So we need a horizontal identity and a horizontal composition to get a by category. So this is highly non-trivial and uh, quite technical. So I won't go into detail with this. So the horizontal identity is defined in, in terms of what is known as the Hargreaves standard form construction. So this is denoted as L2 of A for every Banach algebra A. 
uh, think of this as a Banach algebra version of the trivial bimodule construction associated to an algebra. So observe that here. Um, so if we had a Banach algebra, then uh, since uh, bimodules over Banach algebras are Hilbert spaces, then we would have to construct uh, a Hilbert space uh, in such a way that we get actions on the left and on the right by product on A. So uh, this is usually done through the GNS construction. So this uh, takes uh, an extra set of data uh, given to us in the form of a uh, trace or a weight or whatever, then we construct uh, a Hilbert space and then this is the correct notion of a uh, trivial bimodule, but this is defined in terms of extra data. This is defined, um, this is independent of this extra data up to isomorphisms, but of course we want horizontal identities to be defined on the nodes, not up to isomorphisms. So the Hogg group standard form does this. So we consider this as a coordinate tree version of the GNS construction. Uh, so the Hogg group standard form does this at the price that it's a lot more complicated than the GNS construction. Um, now horizontal composition is what is known as the con uh, fusion tensor product of CFTP, uh, which is denoted like this for a compatible pair of uh, bimodules. So think of this as a Bonomian algebra version of the relative tensor product. So again, this is technical and depends on how to look at it. So it's difficult to define. So the details are not important. Uh, with this structure, W star is a by category, and we write W star fact for the sub by category of W star that's generated by factors. So this is introduced in this over here. Um, so yeah, this is obviously a mod like by category. So W star has binomial algebra as subjects, by modules as morphisms, and uh, and by mo and intertwiners as two morphisms, the Hagg group standard form as horizontal identity and the CFTP as horizontal composition operation. Uh, and W star fact is the same thing, just with factors instead of uh, general domain algebra. Uh, what can we say about W star? Well, there's this very beautiful theorem by Bartos, Douglas, and Henriquez proven in, in 2014, where they prove that. Uh, if this is a subfactor, then uh, it has been indexed if and only if this one morphism is equalizable in the uh, by category W star fact. And in that case, they can compute uh, the index in terms of uh, the trace of this as the square root of the trace of this one morphism. So yeah, this says that W star fact is a very smart object. It's, uh, it recognizes when a subfactor has been indexed and it can actually compute uh, this index uh, categorically and thus for you. Um, we can also say the following. So uh, Lanzmann in uh, 2000, 2001 proves that uh, two binomial algebras A and B are isomorphic in W star if and only if they're uh, strong modi equivalent. Uh, this notion of strong modi equivalent was introduced by Riefel in 34 and it means this thing here. So that doesn't matter. What matters is that strong modi equivalence is not the strictest uh, notion of isomorphism between binomial algebras, uh, but between binomial algebras, so star isomorphisms is so. Uh, also, there is an obvious tensor uh, product operation in binomial algebras and factors, which is the usual algebraic tensor product with a completion. Um, by modules and intertwiners morally, uh, sorry, sorry, there is an obvious tensor product operation on binomial algebras, factors, by modules, and intertwiners, morally making W star into a symmetric monoidal by category. And the coherence data of this is defined in terms of star morphisms. So, um, we are in a mod-like bicategory situation. So we have a bicategory defined by uh, some sort of algebras, uh, by modules and by module morphisms. And uh, we have a moral uh, symmetric monoidal structure. Uh, we have a notion of, a uh, strict notion of morphism between the objects. We have star morphisms between the main algebras. So uh, following our slogan, what we want to do is to extend this to a double category of the main algebras having um, uh, star morphisms as vertical morphisms. Uh, so we try to do this following uh, the construction of bracketed mod. So we consider squares of this form where uh, now A, B, C, and D are binomial algebras, H and K are Hilbert bimodules, F and G are star morphisms, and T uh, is an equivariant bounded intertwiner, so a bounded operator satisfying this condition. So the collection of such squares is obviously a categorical under but this obviously a category under vertical concatenation. So we call this W star one, bracketed W star one, sorry. So uh, now we have uh, for our double category W star bracket or bracketed W star, we have objects which are binomial algebras, vertical morphisms, which are star morphisms between binomial algebras, uh, horizontal morphisms, which are by modules, squares, which are these things here. We have obvious source and we have 
of your source and target functors. And we have uh, a horizontal identity and horizontal composition defined only on objects. So we need a horizontal identity and horizontal composition uh, functorial extensions. So this again is highly non-trivial. Um, this was done by Barco, Douglas, and Henriquez in a specific case, which I will explain. Uh, so suppose A and B are factors. Suppose F is uh, a star morphism between A and B. Observe that in this case, this here is a subfactor. So we'll say that A morphism here is a finite morphism if this subfactor is finite in this. I will write fact less than infinity for the category of factors and finite morphisms, and we'll write mod one less than infinity for the subcategory of uh, w star one generated by squares with factor vertices and finite vertical edges. So we call this finite equivariant bounded intertwiner. So w star one, the category of d squares, where well, all the vertices are um, factors and where these morphisms here are finite. Um, so we have the following theorem by Bartels, Douglas, and Henriquez. So uh, there exist uh, functors L2 and box times from here to here, such that on objects, this is the uh, Hagrid standard form construct construction, and this is the DFTP construction. Uh, so this is again non-trivial, and they use very nice techniques in operator algebra. So they see, they use the theory of minimal conditional expectations for pin index subfactors of Kosaki, or uh, their pictorial version of this. So this, they have a very nice uh, pictorial version of this of this theory, and they use this in an essential way. So, uh, this, so well, this is important just because there is no version of these techniques for uh, infinite index uh, morphisms available in general. So there's no clear way of how to extend this uh, functors uh, in terms of uh, techniques of finite algebra. Um, okay, so with the above functors, fact less than infinity and mod one less than infinity is a double category. We denote this double category by PDH. Uh, by Bartels, Douglas, and Henriquez. <laughs> so BDH satisfies this equation here. So the horizontalization of BDH is W star fact, uh, the bicategory of factors. Um, so we have the following observations. So BDH is easily made into a symmetric monoidal double category with tensor product of binary algebra, star morphisms, and uh, the tensor product of Hilbert bimodules. Uh, BDH is the basis for the construction of the Bartels Douglas Henriquez uh, symmetrical nodal tricategory of coordinate three conformal nets appearing in a series of very nice but also very difficult papers uh, ending in this paper here. And uh, BDH uh, directly recognizes strong weight equivalent uh, in index isomorphisms of semi simple binary algebras, uh, well, factors, but they can extend this to what is known as semi simple binary algebras. So yeah, uh, BDH is a very nice object uh, and it solves our uh, problem of uh, being in a mod-like uh, situation with uh, binary algebras or both with factors. Uh, if our correct notion of morphism is uh, fin index morphism, uh, but it's not, uh, we, we want to extend this to uh, general star morphisms. Uh, so the question is, uh, is there a double category of general binary algebras? Uh, not necessarily factors um, satisfying these conditions here. Um, the strategy for this would be to consider an easier question. So uh, we want a double category of uh, the name and algebras uh, and star morphisms extending BDH. Then uh, we can just consider the problem of uh, defining a double category of factors and star morphisms extending BDH. And uh, if we do have that, then we might be able to use uh, direct integral methods, so limit methods. So we can take advantage of the fact that double categories are uh, well behaved with respect to limits. Um, so yeah, this is the problem we're interested in. So we're interested in extending BDH to general Bonhamian algebras and general star morphisms. So we're interested in a double category of Bonhamian algebras and star morphisms containing BDH. So the strategy that we're following is just uh, consider, uh, try to build a double category of factors and general star morphisms extending BDH. Uh, this is related to this question here. Uh, so Peterson, Ishan, and Ruth uh, define Bonham couplings uh, between Bonham and algebras in this preprint here as Bonham and algebras satisfying certain conditions. Uh, so these conditions are not important, just the thing is that uh, if you have two Bonham and algebras, then a coupling between these two Bonham and algebras is a third Bonham and algebra satisfying certain conditions. So we can organize uh, Bonham and algebras into a bicategory. 
then we should be able to organize uh, von Neumann algebras, von Neumann couplings uh, by modules and intertwiners into a tri category. And also, we have, we have a, a tensor product of uh, a symmetric tensor product or a moral symmetric tensor product for uh, von Neumann algebras, obviously, couplings and um, by modules and intertwiners. So, if we define this uh, tri category, then uh, we might be able to define a symmetric monoidal uh, structure on this tri, -cat tri category. And then if we study uh, the dual isoball objects, um, we can have prospects of associating three-dimensional lo local topological quantum field theories to uh, some Bernoulli algebras, to dual isoball Bernoulli algebras, uh, through the um, yeah covertism hypothesis. So uh, the strategy for this is to define a bicategory internal to symmetric monoidal categories, which is the strategy that Bartels, Douglas, and Henriquez uh, followed when defining their uh, symmetric monoidal tricategory of uh, coordinate free conformal nets. So this must pass through a double category of the name algebra. So yeah, the point here is that we're very interested in defining a double category of the name and algebra and thus a double category of uh, factors, uh, obviously extending BDH. Um, okay, so this, lead, this leads us to uh, globularly generated double categories. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, the strategy that we follow is the following. So first observe that uh, the theory, so as I said, the theory of Bernoulli algebras uh, does not give us direct uh, tools to extend this double category BDH to general polymorphism. So uh, we should try to solve the problem uh, categorically. So this means that we should try to understand uh, any such object, any uh, extension of BDH in terms of its surrounding categorical structure. So the surrounding categorical structure of a double category of factors and general star morphisms extending BDH would be the category of double categories of factors and uh, some sorts of morphisms. Um, so pictorially, <laughs> this looks as follows. So some of you might be familiar with this uh, picture. So this is a self-made uh, uh, version of the uh, picture in uh, David David and Brendan's book, so I didn't want to use that picture without asking, so I made my own, but uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a pretty ugly version, so I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, um, so the picture that we have is um, something like this. So we have an object that we don't know how to define uh, through the techniques that we would usually use. Uh, so we want to understand this categorically. So we put this in a context, uh, in the context of the category of double categories of factors and star morphisms and understand the relations of this object with its surrounding categorical structure and then hope that uh, through this relations we can close in on the um, um, analytic structure that is needed to define this. So uh, if we're going to do this, then uh, we need to know that this uh, external structure uh, surrounding this objects that we want to define is obviously non-empty, like that's the uh, first uh, question that we should be that we should be able to answer. So uh, we have the following question. Are there double categories of factors at all? <laughs> is the above uh, shaded square the six channels for non-empty? So we started with the question of, are there extensions of uh, BDH to uh, general von Neumann algebra star morphisms? We reduced that to, is there an extension to factors and general star morphisms? And now we're with the question, uh, is there a double category of uh, factors and general star morphisms at all? So again, uh, the analysis doesn't help much here. So we have to treat this question in the most uh, general setting possible. So um, the first thing that we do is to uh, phrase the problem uh, in general terms. So this is where the decorated by categories come in. So uh, a decorated by category uh, is a pair of B star comma B, where B star is a category and B is a by category such that the objects of B star um, and B are the same. So we represent this equation as a bunch of diagrams of this form, where these are the globular diagrams for uh, the underlying by category B, and these are the, uh, for, uh, the arrows for the decoration B star. And we assume that the sets of vertices of the two types of diagrams are the same. So essentially, that's the situation we can see. So in our example, so vertices are of the new algebras, horizontal morphisms or horizontal arrows are by modules. These are bounded intertwiners, and these are. Uh, star morphisms. Uh, so an example of this, of course, is if C is a double category, then the pair formed by the category of vertical arrows of C and the horizontal bicategory of C is a decorated bicategory. 
So we write H star C for this decorated by category and we call it the decorated uh, Poisson polarization of C. Um, okay, so we have the following problem. Given a decorated by category B star comma B, uh, find double category C such that uh, the decorated Horizon polarization of C is B star comma B. We call any such double category C an internalization of B star comma B. So if we consider B star comma B as an enriched object and C as an internal object, so if uh, we turn an enriched object into an internal object through this uh, vertical direction. So uh, if we're given uh, decorated by category B star comma B, we want to find internalizations for B star comma B. So um, we call this the problem of existence of internalizations again. So um, this problem asks uh, is the, if the decorated horizontalization construction is generic. Uh, in the slides that I had uh, on the horizontalization uh, or horizontal by category um, uh, functor, uh, we had two uh, right inverses for this. Uh, or one and the other were restricted to uh, strict double categories. So that meant that uh, every um, by category uh, can be interpreted as the horizontal by category of a double category. It's a trivial double category. And uh, if it's a if the by category is strict, then it can be interpreted as the horizontal by category of two uh, double two different double categories. It's horizontal, it's trivial double category, and it's double category of pointers. So yeah, in that case, the every by category, uh, the, sorry, the horizontal by category construction is uh, generic. So we're asking for the same thing for this uh, decorated horizontalization construction. We can think of this problem as a problem of coherently filling hollow squares of this form, which we form with the one dimensional data provided to us by B star comma B in such, so, in such a way that the one dimensional and globular data we started with is fixed. So we start with a decorated by category um, which is a bunch of diagrams like this, then uh, since the objects here are all the same, then we can fit uh, the one dimensional diagrams, the one dimensional parts of this diagram into uh, hollow squares like this. And so this problem asks if we can uh, fill this squares into a double category in such a way that uh, the globular squares are the uh, globular diagrams that we started with. Um, so, Problems of filling squares with globular data appear in Brown's proof of the two-dimensional cipher time Campbell theorem. Uh, this is not the right reference, but this is so. This is their book, where the book of Brown, Higgins, and Severo, where they explain this in a very nice way. Well, this has been considered uh, in other places, uh, arguably since uh, the original paper of Erisman, but uh, they considered this with this language of filling square. Um, okay, so uh, we want to solve we want to solve this problems of uh, existence of internalizations for decorated by categories. Um, okay, so what we do is we sort of minimize this problem. <clears throat> so suppose C is a double category, uh, write gamma C for the minimal sub-double category, sub category of C containing all vertical morphisms of C and all globular squares of C. Um, so we prove this following lemma with respect to gamma C. So if C is a double category, then the decorated horizontalization of C equals the decorated horizontalization of gamma C. And if D is any sub-double category of C satisfying this equation here, or this equation here, then gamma C is a sub-double sub category of C. So uh, what this means is the following. So if C is a double category, then C is obviously a solution to the <clears throat> problem of existence of internalizations for its decorated horizontalization. So number one says that uh, so is gamma C. And number two says that not only that, but gamma C is the minimal solution to this problem contained in C. So we call gamma C the globularly generated piece of C. So we have the following question. Can we understand this minimal solutions uh, to problems of existence of internalizations independently of the uh, double category in which they're defined? Um, so yeah. Um, we say that a double category C is globularly gener generated if any of the following three equivalent conditions is satisfied. So first, uh, C equals uh, its globularly generated piece. Uh, two, C is generated as a double category by its globular squares. And three, uh, C contains no proper sub-double categories, uh, D such that um, H star C equals H star D. So intuitively, C is a globular, globularly generated double. So intuitively, if C is a double category, then C is globularly generated. If every square of C admits a subdivision, say like this, 
where every smaller square is either a horizontal identity or a globular square. Um, observe that this equation holds uh, for any double category uh, C. So the globularly generated piece of a double category is always globularly generated. Uh, and the globularly generated piece of a double category uh, is not just the minimal solution for the problem of existence of internalizations of its uh, decorated horizontalization, but it's also its maximal globularly generated self double category. So, um, yeah, globularly generated double categories are essentially the minimal solutions with respect to uh, the problem of existence of internalizations for decorated by categories. Uh, if we have a decorated by category and we can find a solution to its uh, problem of existence of internalizations or any internalization, we can always find canonically uh, um, contained in this solution a globularly generated solution. So, <clears throat> yeah, so the lesson here is that uh, if we're interested in problems of existence of internalizations, as we are, we study, um, sorry, I wrote basis here for gamma, but uh, we study uh, globularly generated double categories. So yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> uh, well, what can we say about globularly generated double categories? So suppose C is a globularly generated double category, then uh, the main thing that we can say about C is that uh, its category of squares uh, is canonically filtrated. Uh, the filtration is defined as follows. So we define this inductively. So um, we start with uh, a globularly generated double category C. We write H0 for the set of all uh, globular squares and horizontal identity squares of C. And we write B1 for the category uh, generated by H0. So we start with uh, a globularly generated double category uh, C. We just take all its globular squares and horizontal identities and we compose them vertically and we form this uh, category B1. Um, so Suppose we define V in n minus one uh, for uh, a positive integer n. So we write Hn for the pseudo sub pseudo double category of this uh, category of uh, horizontal uh, squares on the horizontal composition defined by V in minus one. And then we make Vn to be the subcategory of C1 generated by Hn. So um, suppose we have defined uh, this uh, n minus one uh, term of our filtration, then what we do is just take all the squares there, compose them horizontally, and then compose them vertically and get a category Vn. So uh, we have this uh, obvious inclusion. So Vn is contained in Vn plus one for every n, and this is contained in the category of squares of C. And of course, the limit of this sequence is um, the category of squares of C. So the collection of Vn is a filtration for the category of squares of C. So we call this filtration the vertical filtration of C. Uh, so yeah, we can say that about globularly generated double categories. We can associate a uh, canonical filtration to its uh, category of squares. Um, through this filtration, we can define a numerical invariant uh, for uh, squares and globularly generated double categories, and thus uh, for globularly gener generated categories in general. So suppose C is a globularly generated double category, and suppose phi is the square in C, and write L5 for the minimum of all positive integers and such that phi is the square in the nth term of the vertical filtration of, phi, of n. So we call L phi the vertical length of phi. Uh, write LC for the supremum of uh, vertical lengths of squares in C, and we call LC the vertical length of C. And for a general category C, double category C, we define the vertical length of C as the vertical length of its globularly generated piece. So this length uh, function uh, defines um, numerical invariance for general double categories. Um, so observe that the length, the vertical length of a square is always a positive integer, so the vertical length of a double category uh, in principle could be infinite. So the intuition is the following. So the uh, length, vertical length of a double category measures the complexity of mixed compositions of horizontal identity and globular squares. So uh, if a double category is such that uh, its globular, its vertical length is one, then uh, every square in C can be written as a vertical composition of globular and horizontal identity squares. So uh, globularly, genera globularly generated double categories of length one are considered to be the easy ones. So we have the following example. So all these double categories that we consider have a vertical length one. So the obvious question is, is the length of every double category uh, one? So is this length function trivial? Uh, the answer is no, and I'll explain this uh, in a couple of slides. Um, okay, so but in the end, we're in the business of constructing internalizations that are uh, decorated by categories. So 
as I mentioned before, if we want to construct an internalization of a decorated by category, then this internalization contains a globularly generated internalization um, canonically. And um, so this globularly generated double category is minimal with respect to this property and has some structure. So at least has this vertical filtration. So uh, yeah, if we start with a decorated by category and we're just interested in the problem of existence of an internalization, then we better look for a globularly generated uh, internalization. So this is what we do. So we start with a decorated by category, B star comma B. So we wish to associate to B star comma B a globularly generated double category defined only through the data of B star comma B. So the idea is the following. So we formally reconstruct the vertical filtration of a supposed uh, double category, so supposed internalization of B star comma B, and then uh, turn that into a globularly generated double category. So how do we do this? Well, so we start with the data of B star comma B, which is a bunch of diagrams of this form. So we start by interpreting these diagrams as being inside a double category. So we interpret these diagrams as horizontal compositions, sorry, horizontal identities and the diagrams as uh, globular squares. Um, so we stack the above diagrams vertically. So formally we define, we write F1 for the three category generated by diagrams of this form. Uh, then we write E1 for the collection of formal words on uh, compatible elements of F1. So E1 is a collection of formal expressions of this form where all the squares are morphisms uh, in this free category here or vertical more vertical compositions of these things. Uh, so yeah, in the same way that we define the vertical filtration, we inductively define the chain of categories, et cetera. And we take the limit of this uh, chain of three double category, three categories. So it does define F infinity formed by quilted, um, is quilted by, so, sorry, the squares or the morphisms of F infinity um, are quilted from uh, these diagrams here or formed by patches of these diagrams here. Uh, but um, this is in general not a uh, double category, it doesn't satisfy the exchange relation and it does not contain the information containing these arguments. So uh, what we do is we carefully choose an equivalence relation R in this uh, category of quilted squares. Uh, containing both the exchange relation and the composition information of B star comma B. And we write Q B star comma B for this question. Uh, then we have the following theorem. If B star comma B is, the decorated, is a decorated by category, then this uh, quotient is a globularly generated double category, such that the category of objects of this double category is our original uh, decoration B star. And uh, this uh, by category, the underlying by category of our decorated by categories only contained in the horizontalization of uh, the double category we constructed. Uh, we call Q B star comma B the free globularly generated double category associated to B star comma B. Uh, and well, uh, this equality does not always hold. Uh, here's an example of this, which is very simple, but yeah, there's no time to talk about this. <laughs> but yeah, in general, this is not true. Uh, the only thing that's true is this here. Um, so we say that A decorated by category B star comma B is saturated if this equation holds. That is, if it's uh, if the free globularly generated double category associated to B star comma B is an internalization of B star comma B. So we have easy tests to decide if A decorated by category is saturated. I won't mention them, but probably do have them. So um, we have the following example. If B star, uh, we have the following examples. If B star is, has no sections or retractions, uh, we call this uh, reduce uh, decorated by categories, in particular if B star is free or the, the loop of uh, a reduced monolith of B star comma B is saturated. Um, so we're interested in uh, saturated decorated by categories, of course. So we have a fulfillment lemma. If B star comma B is a decorated by category, then we have this equation here, and thus this is a saturated decorated by category. Um, so what this says is that if B star comma B is not a saturated by category, as we want, uh, then we can always enlarge it um, canonically in order to obtain a saturated decorated by category. So, okay, so we use this to construct an internalization of, of factors. So if we write fact for the category whose objects are factors and whose morphisms are possibly infinite star morphisms, so I already uh, yeah, mentioned this notation. Uh, so yeah, this is a category of factors in general star morphisms. So we call it W star fact is the by category of factors by module star bounded uh, intertwiners. Um, then uh, this pair here is a decorated by category. So uh, we prove uh, in 19 through our tests that the decorated by category fact W star fact is actually saturated. So the free 
globularly generated double category associated to this that correctify categories is a double category of factors and general star morphisms in the sense that we want. Um, so yeah, this gives us uh, compatible extensions of the Bartle, Douglas, and Henriquez uh, L2 and uh, CFTP uh, functors, of course. Um, well, there is a downside to this. Uh, these functors do not extend their functors, actually. Uh, so sorry, I said there's there, there are compatible functors like this extending the uh, Hagger of L2 standard form function and the uh, CFTP function of the BDH versions of this. Uh, these functors do not extend the BDH versions of this. So this is this does not contain uh, the globularly generated piece of BDH. Uh, but yeah, we later fix this and we actually use this thing here to uh, construct an actual extension. Um, but yeah, the thing is that there are double categories of factors, which was the initial problem that we were interested in. So um, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> and we did this uh, completely categorically. So uh, one other thing that we can say about this uh, free globularly generated double category construction is that we can build, we had this um, a numerical invariant that we could associate to general double categories through this um, vertical filtration and the globularly generated piece, which was the vertical length. And as I mentioned, all our examples had uh, vertical length one. Uh, so there was a question of, of if that was a trivial uh, invariant. So yeah, we can answer that question. We can construct uh, double categories with non-trivial vertical length through the uh, um, free globularly generated double category construction. So a specific example is the following. So uh, consider this uh, uh, by category. So this has three objects uh, and only uh, one non-trivial uh, two morphisms, uh, which uh, obeys the rules of uh, set two and they create this uh, by category through this uh, category where this is an equalizer of this. And so this two compositions are equal to this morphism here. Then in that case, the free globularly generated double category associated to uh, this decorated by category has uh, uh, a square of vertical length two. We can actually prove that this has a vertical length two. So uh, with these methods, we can actually construct a chain of um, double categories so of length n for every n. And we can take the limit and then we get uh, a double category of uh, infinite length. So yeah, this length uh, invariant is non-trivial. So, I'll end with some final remarks. So the free globularly generated double category construction is a, actually we can prove that this is a free object on globularly generated double categories with respect to their credit horizontalization. We can prove that this is faithful. And so um, on a globularly generated double category. So we can thus describe every globularly generated double category as a canonical double quotient of the free globularly generated double category of its uh, the created person position. So yeah, this free globularly generated double category does tell us about a lot about the square that we started with about the category of double categories of internalizations of a decorated by category. So we can use this to construct an extension of the globularly generated piece of the BDH uh, double category to arbitrary star morphisms. So this provides a second non-double equivalent double category of factors. So we have two non-equivalent double categories of factors. So the question is, how many of these uh, can we build? Uh, what's the structure? A more uh, serious question is, what's the structure of the category of um, double categories of factors? Well, question answer is the following. So we can build uh, one, so for every decorated by category, if we have some nice structure, we can build one uh, vertical one one internalization of vertical length one for every special in the functor uh, monoidal vibration some type of monoidal vibration so there is evidence that um, yeah this uh, problem of existence of internalizations for decorated by categories is actually controlled for some by some uh, homology theory so of course we want to build this homology somehow um, yeah well so these are references and. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, very nice. So thanks a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. Yeah, thank you. So are there any questions or any comments? If you have them, please either raise your hands or write in the chat of uh, Zoom, YouTube, or Zulip, or wherever you're connecting from.
I guess I have a kind of easy or trivial question, or maybe it's not a very good question. Um, so was the, back in the beginning, you were talking about mod-like double categories. Is a way to say it that there is some kind of faithful functor from the horizontal uh, category? So the category of horizontals as objects and squares as morphisms to the category D0 of objects and vertical? Um, so, yeah, well, so, so you mean in, so you mean in, 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 in the specific case of uh, mod like by categories? Yeah. Is it um, that there's some kind of faithful functor from? Um, well, so, yeah, so this term mod like by categories, so I treated this very, uh, very broadly in the, so for, just for the purposes of the talk, but, uh, in uh, Schulman's paper, the, so he has a very uh, precise definition of what he means. So this is, this includes this condition of being a vibrant uh, double category or a framed uh, by category. And so this includes, so this is sort of like the heart of this uh, mod like uh, by categories. And so this is, so as I mentioned, what this does is essentially make it, it allows for um, coherence that a symmetric monoidal structure of symmetric monoidal structures on this double category to go down to the horizontal by category. And this is defined in terms of, um, um, yeah, not, 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 not a faithful embedding, but a vibration. So what you can say in this case is, is that you get, you actually get a vibration. So these are considered um, as sort of a base chains for functors. So in the case of, um, in the case of algebras and modules, so you get modules on one on the one hand and algebras on the other, and uh, the embedding, which I'm assuming that's what you that might be what you're thinking of. So which is the uh, for, uh, horizontal the source and target. Uh, so these are vibrations; they're they're not embedding, I suppose. It sounds like you're telling me what a frame by. I, I think I might be missing. What, I guess what I was thinking of is like a module is is like a, a group or a set with an with. Uh, actions by the rings or whatever. And I thought yeah. by function slash correct, you meant like that it was a map of those abelian groups. Um, or, but th I guess those aren't objects in that, that category. So maybe I'm thinking of my own specific category and confusing it with the general case. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I think that's what's going on. Yeah, sorry if I, if I yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, well, I think that's yeah, yeah. And so another question, is your free construction, your free globularly generated thing um, and add left adjoint to getting a decorated. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the uh, co unit of this. Uh, so that's sort of uh, so not so that's actually very interesting. So that's the sort of uh, projection uh, from the uh, free thing to any globularly generated internalization. So that's exactly what I used to construct this extension uh, to BDH. And so that's a that's a very interesting uh, thing to study. So it just sort of gives you bounds on this uh, invariance, and yeah. So that's um, yeah, yeah. So it's left the joint to uh, the credit horizontalization. Yes. Mm. Cool. And uh, yeah, the credit horizontalization restricted to globular degenerated double categories is faithful. So yeah, I'd like to interpret that as ah. uh, free globular degenerated double categories being a free construction with respect to this uh, construct. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Are there any more questions? It seems that there are none. So, well, let's move this to an offline discussion. And uh, well, let's thank Juan again. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>